Okay. Okay, great. So um, again, I'm Desiree Armas. I just graduated this year. Um, I was a, an environmental studies and anthropology double major with a minor in social justice. Um, I was involved in a number of clubs um, and I was very active on my campus. And I am from New Jersey. So I'm, I'm from around this area. Um, and I can't wait to have this conversation with you, John, to see what your experience was like at St. Peter's um, before, during, and after. Um, if you can be so kind as to state your name and spell it slowly, please. It's John Murray, J-O-H-N-M-U-R-R-A-Y. Thank you, John. Um, today is Monday, June 14th, 2021. And today I am interviewing uh, you, John, John Murray, on uh, your unique experiences at St. Peter's um, as a student um, in celebration of the 150th anniversary of St. Peter's University. So now we're gonna go into the questions. Um, my first question for you is, John, if you can please describe your childhood, your family, and where you grew up before you came to St. Peter's. If you could just give me like a, like a timeline, give me like a decade or a year where to start off our story today. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, the home of St. Peter's College University. And uh, my mom and dad were immigrants uh, from Ireland. Uh, they uh, came over here in their early 20s because there was no opportunities in Ireland for them. So they came over here and uh, they uh, met over here and got married and had six children. And uh, we lived in uh, Our Lady of Victories Parish in Jersey City, which was the typical thing that in those days you identified yourself as what parish you belonged to. And uh, we, we grew up and, uh, and we had a great family. Um, my dad and mom, we, we certainly didn't have any money or weren't wealthy at all. My dad worked on the railroad. And my mom was a cleaning lady in uh, Colgate um, Olive Company in downtown Jersey City. And we all, but well, we had a good education. We went to Catholic grammar school, Lady of Victories, and we went to Catholic high schools, uh, St. Michael's. Uh, I went to Our Lady, uh, I mean, uh, St. Aloysius High School. And my brother Billy went to St. Peter's Prep. But, uh, you know, we had a great time. We loved Jersey City. It was a great experience growing up there. And uh, I, I loved it. It was, uh, as I told my mother, I didn't know I was poor until I moved out of Jersey City. Because <laughs> everybody, everybody was just like me. We didn't have anything. And, you know, we lived with it and it was great. <laughs> right. And I can, oh, is, can you hear me all right? Pardon me? Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can now. Oh, okay. Um, I can completely empathize with that. Um, I'm also, well, my parents are immigrants. Um, I myself was born in Peru um, and I came here when I was very young, but I also grew up like in a working class neighborhood. Most of my friends were, you know, first generation immigrants as well, except for us, it was, we were from like South America. And I'm yeah. assuming you grew up with other, um, other Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants. Can you tell me a little bit about what the neighborhood looked like? Well, our neighborhood was pretty much Irish and Italian immigrants. Um, you know, the Italians uh, uh, families, mostly the parents spoke only Italian, didn't speak English. And if they did, they didn't speak it very well. And, uh, you know, the, the children learned how to speak Italian and listen to their mom and dad, but then they learned the English language very well too. But in my case, my mom and dad uh, had that Irish brogue and a lot of their friends had Irish brogues and I couldn't understand a word they said, but my mom and dad tried to make sure they blended in as best they could. So they tried to lose their Irish accents and become Americans. 
So it's kind of funny to watch them. What you know, my mom, I thought, didn't have much of an accent except when you talked to her on the phone. <laughs> and then, it, then it became very pronounced. <laughs> um, well, great. Thank you for sharing that, John. And just um, just so that I can understand our timeline, um, what decade was this? Like, what years were this before you entered St. Peter's? I uh, let's see. I was born in 1936. Um, in 10 days, I'll be 85 years old. Oh, wow, congratulations. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, the uh, when we went to grammar school, I started in first grade at five years old. So I graduated from grammar school, uh, Lady of Victories at 12. And I graduated from St. Al's at 16. And I graduated from St. Peter's when I was 20. So I was younger than some of the other kids in my class. And and people said, well, that's because you're smart. I said, no, I don't think so. I think it was because I was giving my parents such a hard time. They wanted to get me out of the house and get me <laughs> into school. <laughs> so, but it was, um, that was the days. And we graduated from St. Aloysius in 1953. That was the high school. It was taught by Sisters of Charity, uh, same as my grammar school, a Lady of Victories. And then... Um, then I went into St. Peter's in 1953 in the summer. And it was a great time to be around. Um, the uh, the business world was booming because war, after World War II, it started to get very active in America and the businesses started to grow very rapidly. And um, the when I started at St. Peter's, it just, it just was the end of the Korean War. Um, and the Korean War, the peace treaty was signed in, I think, July of 53, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, so when we went to St. Peter's, the, uh, a lot of the kids that were in my class were guys that were coming back from the service. And it was a good time for St. Peter's, too, because the enrollment was increasing because these kids that would normally be in a school were in the Army or Navy or whatever, and uh, they were coming back and going into to St. Peter's. So it was kind of a mixed crew we had. We had some young kids in the class and some olders because they they had finished their service with, with that Korean conflict. But at that time, there was a mandatory draft. You know, you had to go in a service. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't like today where you have to volunteer. But, mm -hmm. but it was a great, it was a great time. Hmm. And um, back then it was St. Peter's College. And was it still all just um, male students? It absolutely was. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let any of you kids in there. <laughs> it was, uh, they had uh, in the evening school uh, when I was there, the, the evening school had a couple of women in it. But the day school, we had no women in the day school. Mm. Um, and so it was it was not until probably 10, 12 years later that they got their first women in the day school. Mm. And was that common to, to go to an all male, all male college? Yeah, it was with the religious orders. Um, mm. And you got to remember, too, another thing is in those days, not many women went to college. Um, there was pretty much, uh, you know, male dominated activity because, uh, you know, the, the Irish mothers and fathers and Italian mothers and fathers, they, you know, the girls are going to get married. They don't need to do this education bit. So right. they didn't they didn't push them to go to school the way uh, the boys were pushed to go to school. <laughs> hmm. and, and that brings us to our second question. Um, what uh, brought you to St. Peter's College? What were some of the reasons why you wanted to go to St. Peter's at the time? Well, um, my brother Bill um, graduated uh, five years ahead of me from high school, and he went to St. Peter's College, um, and he majored in accounting. And so when I was getting out of high school, I was thinking about going into service and my mom, God bless her, convinced me that I should go to college rather than go into service. So it would be better for me to start school. So I thought St. Peter's handy. And the other side of the coin is 
I couldn't afford to go to a college that was somewhere away from Jersey City. It was, you know, like a day school in St. Peter's in those days, no dormitories or anything. And the tuition was affordable. My, my parents couldn't pay the tuition for me. They couldn't afford it. And so it was up to me to work um, and uh, pay the tuition. So I could work in the A&P after school. And I had a job on, uh, on West Side Avenue in Jersey City. There was an A&P food store there that I worked in after school. And uh, it gave me enough earnings because I worked over 30 hours a week um, during the oh. and uh, it gave me enough earnings to pay the tuition. So that's the way I did it. Okay. That's what got me there. And it had a good reputation as a school. So the the Jesuit order, right? The 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 fact that it was a Catholic institution, that wasn't one of like the main reasons why you went. Well, it, it was in a way, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, um, it was important to me to, to get to the Jesuits. They were great educators. They had a great reputation. And I said, this is a good school for me to go to. So in a way, but I said the, the most, you know, compelling reason was probably the, the locality of it and the fact that it was close to home and I could get there easily enough and work. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you got to St. Peter's, right? Yep. Uh, this is 1953, you're yep. se 17 years old. Uh, what uh, did you decide to major in, to minor in? Uh, maybe talk about like your first year at St. Peter's. Okay. Um, you know, what did you expect to come out of that uh, experience? Well, it's funny, cause I knew I had declared my major as accounting. And um, in those days, uh, the Jesuits kind of looked down on accountants. <laughs> they called us the men of the almighty dollar. And uh, oh. they, they, were, they were big believers in a liberal arts education. And then they still are. Um, but one of the things that um, struck me when I started, I, I did not have an elective in four years at St. Peter's the Jesuits decided what courses I was going to take. So I was taking the same English courses as the English majors, poetry and literature and essay. Um, I was taking the same history courses as the history majors. Um, and I was, you know, all of those courses uh, and the philosophy courses, same as the philosophy majors, theology courses, you know, all the same. So. It was great. They, they insisted that you get a pretty well-rounded education. And I kind of took to it. I, I loved the liberal arts subjects uh, more than I did my accounting subjects. <laughs> but I thought accounting was a good thing to take because it gave me a foundation in business. And that's what I wanted to do when I got out of school, go into business. So, yeah. so that's how I, I, I looked at it. And that's how we went. And, and uh, you know, the, you had a lot of uh, theology, you had a lot of English, and it was, it was fun. It was, and the teachers were excellent. Uh, I had some, I, in those days, there were a lot more Jesuits at St. Peter's than there are today. There were probably 38, 40 Jesuits teaching at the college. And they, you know, it's, they were just like a cut above the lay teachers because, and they, there's a good reason for it because they dedicated their lives to educating people and you know they didn't have the interference of marriage and children and that kind of stuff that you know important and you know you have to focus on if you're a lay person but as a Jesuit you didn't have to and you could focus on education and reading and studying and and they were very gifted people they uh, they were they were smart can you tell me about um one of your professors that you had a good relationship with that left a good impression on you? Yeah, I, you know, I, had a, I tell you, I had a lot of good professors and, and a lot of good relationships with professors. Um, I, I wouldn't want to single any one of them out as, as, as special, but there were a bunch of them that were special. <laughs> they, uh, they were, 
it's particularly the Jesuits, I think. Um, and, you know, they had interesting backgrounds. Uh, my, my poetry teacher in freshman year, uh, he was a former Marine Corps captain who joined the Jesuits. And they, so he's had a lot of experience. My theology teacher in freshman year, was a big man. He was six foot five, 250 pounds at least. <laughs> and this guy was on, I, you may not have ever heard of it, but the Bataan Death March. And that was in World War II where the Japanese had captured a lot of Manila, uh, people from Manila and, and Philippines and Americans. And he was on that Bataan Death March. And when he finished it, he was 95 pounds. So you can think about this big guy and, and you know, and the, the issues he went through before he got to be a Jesuit or be a full priest. So that, they, these guys were really good and very down to earth and, and very good at uh, teaching. So I, I enjoyed them all. And mm -hmm. they, uh, they were really good, good professors. Mm -hmm. And I'm noticing that I'll, I'm noticing that a lot of the memories that you are um, sharing with me tie into some war unfortunately but yeah. you lived through a number of wars um and i can see that they you know they somehow were tied into your life story yeah. um so we're gonna um is there we're gonna get to that a little later yeah. um just so that we can get through these um other questions um so you talked about some of your favorite professors most of them were jesuits um and I've also been uh, lucky to have, well, I've only had one Jesuit professor and he taught me theology and he just knows so much, just yeah. so much. Yeah. And I was actually able to interview him for um, this uh, project as well for this oral history project mm -hmm. and uh, just that dedication, right? He always had that dedication to teaching That's, and you're right. It's amazing how they are. Yeah, no, and just the discipline and their commitment to the students, right? And they stay because of the students. So, uh, and they were also much smarter than me, even though I didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, they are. They're definitely something else. Yeah, one um, of the one of my interesting experience with the Jesuits is in those days, uh, does you you had to take an oral exam in philosophy. On um, it wasn't uh, for your finals, and what it was like in junior year, uh, you would cover the ground that you covered in sophomore and junior year philosophy, and it was so uh, you go before a board of three Jesuits, and get into a debate with them about different philosophical issues. Oh my and, God! Uh, I thought I thought I was brilliant, but of course they twisted me in little knots. <laughs> oh my God, John! It was great. It was great. Uh, well, it was great training. I mean, it taught you to think on your feet and to be able to express yourself in a way that people will understand where you're coming from. So it was good. And uh, but the Jesuits were tough. <laughs> yeah, I, it, that sounds pretty terrifying. And I'm not a fan of philosophy, <laughs> so that would have been disastrous. Well, for me. in my day, we almost had a minor in philosophy. I. I, I, for all I know, I may have had a minor in philosophy, but we had to take a lot of it. We took it in sophomore, junior, and senior year. We had mm. uh, six credits in sophomore year, six in junior, and I think we had three or so in uh, senior year, maybe six. I, I can't remember. Yeah, was, I think, uh, yeah, I think that, that, that would be enough for a minor. It's just, you know, abstract thinking. I like yeah. applied, yeah. like examples. Yeah. So, but, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, my other question is what, um, I know you said you didn't take any electives, but I'm wondering if you were involved in any other activities on campus? Well, you know, not really, uh, not much. I did some, but uh, very little because if I didn't work, I wasn't going to college. <laughs> yeah, I would have assumed it was because of work. And and I would, I work. would leave, I would leave school, let's say, two o'clock and go to work at the AMP by three, and work till eight that night. And you know, on the weekends I would work Saturday, 
mm-hmm. um, and Friday nights late till nine o'clock. So it was, um, I mean, I had long hours and so it didn't give me a lot of time for activities. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, one of the Jesuits um, got mad at me because he wanted me to get involved in all these activities because he was one of these guys who thought that uh, I could become president of the senior class and run the school and da 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 da. <laughs> I said to him, hey, Father, you know, you're talking to, to the wrong guy. I got to work or I'm not going to school. And if I don't make any money, I can't pay the tuition. Right. <laughs> so right. He, uh, he got annoyed at me, but I, I, we were friends. <laughs> we stayed friendly forever. <laughs> And and that's still very common to see at St. Peter's, right? I have a lot of friends who wish they could be more active um, and be more involved, but they're also working those thirty hours and uh, yeah. thirty plus hours, and and it, it's it's you know pretty it's pretty sad and to see that's that. Hard. Yeah, it's it's hard to do that. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to sound like a I did something uh, uh, noble or anything, but it was, you know, you just had to do it to get by. So you mm-hmm. did what you had to do. That's what the world does. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but were there anything that did that did particularly interest you that if you had some time you would have been involved in? Yeah, I would have been into debating and that kind of stuff. Mm. I love that, but I didn't have a chance to do it. <laughs> Interesting. Like debating, what were some of your favorite topics to debate on? Just to get a sense. Yeah, that's a, it's, um, you know, it was, oh, my thinking about it is the way it taught you to have discipline in your thinking and how you can look at both sides of the picture. You know, that's one of the things the Jesuits taught you very well, I think, is that don't look at one issue and say this is the only solution. There are multiple ways you can approach a problem and look at it and say, okay, this works too. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where I think it got into the critical thinking kind of uh, area where, where it really helped people. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that. And a follow-up question to that would be um, if you could tell me about a friendship that took root at St. Peter's, if you can recall a couple of friends you made that you still keep in touch with. Yeah, we had, we, the, the classroom says in those days, uh, like my accounting class, we had a homeroom uh, and it was all accountants in my class. And I had maybe 25, 27 kids like me in the class. Uh, and uh, so you got to know everybody very well. I mean, because you, you went to all the same classes together. You didn't, you know, move around a lot. <laughs> so, uh, so we got to be pretty close to uh, most of my fr- friends at school. And uh, we were friends for life. Uh, most of them have passed on oh, no. by now. And, uh, you know, but, you know, you know, as you, as you grow and you uh, grow in your business and you grow in your family, you kind of lose touch with the, your college friends, you know, from a regular basis then you get together at reunions and talk and it was like you never left them I mean it was like we were always <laughs> close yeah <laughs> yeah so I always felt good about my classmates and you know it's if you looked at the, the names of the kids in the class you'd think it was an Irish law firm because it was like Crowley, Healy, Haggerty, Mahoney, Murray, Sullivan <laughs> 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 and, you know, and we all came from the same kind of background and a bunch of them, Healy, my Haggerty and Mahoney were from Elizabeth, your hometown. And they uh, they grew mm-hmm. up there and went to school there. You know, so it, it was it was kind of a close knit group. Mm-hmm. Oh well, that's that's wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, okay, so now we're um, gonna go into some of these other questions here. Um, um, hold on, let me pause real quick. Okay. So John, um, my next question for you is, what impact uh, did your Jesuit education have on your personal growth, maybe your spiritual growth um, as you left school, right? Can you tell me about how your Jesuit education, your schooling had an impact on you overall? Yeah, I, I think it had a great impact. I 
Um, I'm forever indebted to the Jesuits for the education I got. Uh, I think they prepared me very, very well to succeed in the business world um, and to be an ethical person. And also, I mean, they, they pretty much, you know, focused on um, cure personalis, but they didn't talk about it in those terms. It, it was like, all right, you're going to get an education and you're going to get smart, but you're also going to have to know that part of your existence is to give back, to help others who won't do as well as you or will do as well as you, but you got to help. And uh, so, I mean, I think it prepared me very well. I went out into the business world and I felt I could compete with anybody from any school. You take Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I was in a management program with people uh, from those schools and I did just as well as they did. So I, I think I was uh, well prepared for the business world and uh, well prepared ethically to deal with issues and, you know, spiritually, you know, to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on in the world and help others. And I did. I, I was very active at St. Peter's after I graduated. I, I uh, helped them by fundraising for them. Uh, in those days, we had one day a year where uh, volunteer alumni would go out to uh, other alumni homes and visit with them and ask them to make a contribution to the annual fund. And I did that for 10 years. Actually, when I moved to Minneapolis with Prudential, um, <laughs> they called me up and said, would I do it in Minneapolis? I said, sure, I'll do it in Minneapolis. And I think in Jersey City, I would drive about five miles <laughs> in uh, Minneapolis. I think I was driving a hundred miles to do that fundraising, but it was great. It was helping St. Pete's and I thought that's something I should do. And then Later on, I got involved by, uh, I became a member of the, uh, of the Board of Regents and eventually chairman of that board. And, and then I became a member of the Board of Trustees and I became chairman of that board. And then I became chairman of a, a capital campaign committee and, and we raised 45 million for St. Peter's, which I thought was a good thing for me to help do. So I, you know, I, I tried to, to help with things like that. And in the community, I, I've been involved. I was chairman of the Association for Retarded Citizens in, in Monmouth County, helping them. And then I was chairman of the Irish American Partnership up in Boston, which did educational funding in Ireland for you know, grammar school kids. In Ireland, uh, uh, they needed a lot of STEM focus, but they didn't have it. And uh, so we helped design programs and help teachers learn how to deal with STEM issues and STEM programs and teach it to the kids because Ireland was a pretty much a liberal arts kind of education you got over there. Kids got a good education, but it wasn't in a technical sense any, right. and they needed a lot of technical help. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved in a lot of those things that I think it made the world a little better because I did it. <laughs> right, thank you. And as a former student who just graduated this year, I, I thank you for your efforts to the university. I'm sure that I was able to um, um, with, enjoy a lot of what you and others, other alum have been able to uh, um, obtain for us. So, yeah. so I, I, I do thank you. I, I love St. Peter's. I think I'm going to follow in your footsteps. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't think I ever would either, but now that I'm in Florida, <laughs> oh. it's all right. Well, I, I talked to Dr. Karnacki once in a while. He checks up on me. He's see how I'm doing and how I'm feeling and everything. So mm -hmm. he's a good guy. I love him. He was, he was a, when I first met him, he was a professor. And um, he then he became, uh, you know, a dean, and then you know, on and on. And he's done well in all of the assignments we've had him on. And I can remember, uh, I I was chairman of the the committee that secured the the uh, services of Father Lochran as the president of St. Peter's uh, a number of years ago. And uh, when when it came time when he passed away. And they were looking for a next one. Um, I remember saying, "Why don't you look at Gene?" 
because he'd be a good guy to do it. And I don't want to be on the committee because I did the last committee. <laughs> so, and he became the president. He's done a great job. I think, I think he became president in 2003 or so, somewhere around there. He's been, he's been there a while <laughs> and he's done a great job. No, yeah, uh, you know, President Kornakia, you know, always tries um, his best to listen to students. And personally, he's helped me with, uh, I had a small emergency and he's just been very great with that. Um, yeah. He was really wonderful. No, uh, he's, he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, now, my next question, John, and um, I did mention that we were going to talk about this later on in our chat. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the larger societal issues during your time at St. Peter's and what impact did it have on the St. Peter's community or yourself, um, uh, Jersey City, since you uh, were living there at the time? Just tell me a couple of things that were happening in your surroundings. Well, it's um, Jersey City was a political hotbed of, of uh, what I'd call thievery. <laughs> um, and I can remember doing my uh, time at St. Peter's, some of the politicians that got involved in different things that sent them into jail. Or, <laughs> and, you know, I kind of it was accepted in Jersey City. I, I, I think the people, it didn't bother them. I, you know, people like myself, so there they go again, but you know, I'd say, you know, <laughs> laugh it off and it is what it is. <laughs> so, oh, no. and, um, and it's funny because, yeah, I, you know, I don't know that it ever changed, <laughs> mm. but it's, I, I think it's certainly a little better today than it was when my day. Um, but you know, they had, you know, in, in the nationwide uh, events in those days, um, 1954, for example, they had the McCarthy hearings. I don't know if you're aware of Senator McCarthy and the hearings he ran, but he, he had hearings for a long while. And um, I think they were really terrible what they did to people. He, he was convinced there were a number of people in government service uh, that had become members of the Communist Party and they should be ejected from government service and, you know, fired, get, get you know, out of there. And um, he went on and he had these hearings that had a lot of innuendo, but not a lot of proof. <laughs> and a lot of people's lives got screwed up because of him. And uh, it was it was particularly harmful. It turned out it was particularly harmful to people in Hollywood who a lot of those people were liberals who joined the Communist Party, you know, many years before, but weren't active and didn't do anything and weren't really communist. But since they signed up, um, you know, he, he went after them and they, they were blacklisted and they couldn't get jobs. And so mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of tough. And I mm -hmm. always thought that was just a terrible thing that went on in politics at that time. Uh, okay. But he, he got a lot of notoriety. He was from... I guess from the Midwest, Wisconsin or someplace, he was the Senator and he was the head of this committee. I don't know whether it was a foreign affairs committee and he did all this, but it was, it was very notable because it was on TV every day almost, mm. uh, these hearings that he ran, went through. So, was but but well, other than that, you know, the time when I was growing up in Jersey City, it was a great place. Um, everybody knew everybody else. It was like a, you know, and in those days, they had, they, you wouldn't know this, but the phone system in those days um, were on a basis of what they call party lines. So you had a phone in your house, but there were six other people, six other families that were on that line with you. So if you picked up the phone and somebody was on it, you politely hang it up and let them talk. And, and then you wait till, you, you know, it got free and then you talk on it. But, you know, wow. It was a strange thing to think about today in terms of how it was in those days. But it, 
I always say New Jersey City was like a party line. Everybody knew everybody else. <laughs> Not just you knew a lot of people. It was a small community in a sense. And, uh, and the churches were organized very well. And you got to know all the parishioners. And you know, I did the altar boy routine for a lot of years. So I knew everybody. <laughs> So it was, it was kind of a great place to grow up. I, mm -hmm. I would have nothing but fond memories of my time in Jersey City. As a matter of fact, um, in 1987, uh, when they built the, started building up the waterfront, I bought a condo uh, on the waterfront just to have it so we could go to Jersey City. And my friends in Matawan would look at me and say, where are you going for the weekend? I said, we're going to Jersey City. I said, you're nuts. Nobody goes to Jersey City. Why would you do that? <laughs> I said, I love Jersey City. And it was a great place to grow up. <laughs> and, so uh, and I remember Father Lochran, um, when we sold Jersey City, he said to me, you should sell a house in Matawan and stay in Jersey City. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> but it was, it was great being down here on the waterfront. And, you know, we'd up there for the weekend we'd go into the city and have dinner or go to a play or whatever and it was nice so family enjoyed it um and so just a couple of questions that came up during your answer um sure. so i'm assuming that jersey city um i don't know how uh when the last time you visited jersey city was but um it's very different now right? It's, I, I think Jersey City wasn't as big then, right? When you were still in school. Oh, no, it wasn't nearly as big. The waterfront was not developed. A lot of the sections of town, the downtown area wasn't as developed. No. Mm -hmm. not right. at all. Now, now it's massive. And now we have a, a very diverse city with folks from all different kinds of places. And that's also something that wasn't, that you didn't experience, right? During your time at St. Peter's. Well, you know, we, in, um, in my day, you had most, as I said, mostly Irish and Italian immigrants, uh, but you know, there was a substantial black community in Jersey city and we got along great with them. Um, and not, not very many Asian people uh, and certainly not a lot of Spanish uh, from Peru, Mexico, wherever, you know, just they weren't here at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. but it's it's interesting to see that it Jersey City was was has been a home for immigrants, right? Yeah. And and their children oh, yeah. for a long time. My father and mother got off the boat in Ellis Island and walked across. <laughs> they never <laughs> left Jersey City. <laughs> So, so, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see that it's still this, it's very, uh, it's a thriving like immigrant hub, which is great. Um, yeah, I like that idea. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know too many Peruvians in my day. I had one that worked for me at Prudential, Carlos de Savala. And uh, I told him, uh, you know, he was, he was always a haughty guy. I told him, I said, he's very proud. I said, you Peruvians, or high class. <laughs> he, uh, he was he was really there. A good guy, a great guy. I liked him a lot. Um, also, I'm I'm uh, I'm curious about what you did career wise after you graduated because you mentioned that you were very successful in business and you mentioned Prudential. You moved around a lot. Um, so I'm curious about uh, your your story. Well, I. Uh, when I was getting out of St. Peter's, um, the, uh, you had a choice. I mean, I majored in accounting and you could go to work for one of the CPA firms or go to work for somebody else. And it was interesting. I interviewed with the FBI and General Motors and I interviewed with Prudential. I didn't bother interviewing with the CPA firms. In those days, the starting pay for a college graduate um, in a CPA firm was $2,400 a year. Um, and the FBI was like 6,200. So government was paying three times as much as the CPA firms, um, which has changed quite a bit now. But 
Um, I, I had felt that at the time that the financial services industry was the right place to be. And I decided to go to work for Prudential. And so I started there uh, July 8th, 1957. And I worked there till 1995, 38 years. <laughs> oh, wow. You don't see that anymore. <laughs> That's uh, no. not something. And, and yeah. I had very interesting assignments. And, you know, I, at first I started an internal auditing in the management training program and then moved on to, uh, to electronic computer work. And then I moved on to head up one of the, uh, well, out in Minneapolis to manage the audit staff out there for three years. And then I came back and I became head of our SEC accounting area, uh, financial reporting. And then I became head of all of Prudential's financial reporting. And then uh, and my last couple of assignments were in New York at, in, the, uh, in the brokerage firms, Prudential Securities. I was the chief financial officer and the head of corporate risk management. And I guess I got there because in the early 80s, when we bought Prudential Security, I was on the team from Prudential that was involved in doing the due diligence on that work. And then they asked me to stay over there for a year to help out with the integration of the firm to Prudential. And I did that. And then I, a couple of years later, I became the uh, head of that group over in Prudential Securities. Uh, at one point though, I, I tell everybody, uh, I was the head janitor for Prudential. I, I was I was the senior vice president in charge of corporate services, which was we had the janitorial staff, the we had the planes, the air force, we had all the car services, all the food services, all the architects and engineers. Uh, so it was a pretty diverse group of people, and I, I had a lot of fun in that assignment and that job working with the people. So it was uh, I I had a very interesting career. It was. Uh, it was filled with a lot of diversity and different kinds of opportunities to excel or screw up. <laughs> and hopefully I excel more than I screwed up. <laughs> when did you retire? 1995. 1995. Oh, wow. Wow. That's the American dream, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was 58 years old and I decided I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something different. And <laughs> I decided to retire. And interestingly enough, um, about that time, a little later, um, the, the chief financial officer of St. Peter's retired, or didn't retire, went to take a job as a CFO in a hospital in Jersey City, Christ Hospital. And uh, Father Lachman asked me if I would volunteer to be the chief financial officer of St. Peter's. So. I did that for about a year. So I didn't really retire. I went to work at St. Oh, Peter's. No. <laughs> you, know, oh, no. you never get away from those judgments. <laughs> um, so okay. that's, uh, that's, you know, what I did. And I, I had a great career and I loved it and mm -hmm. enjoyed it. And so, and then, uh, you know, when I retired, I got more involved in some of the charities and doing stuff like that. But, and because I didn't want to stop working or stop doing things. Mm -hmm. I just want to do something different <laughs> and so, I could afford it. And so I did. So your involvement with the college grew after you retire or you had been still helping them out? I was still working with them before I retired. I was chairman of the board of trustees when I was working at Prudential. And uh, oh, oh, you did a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I understand. Okay, and then uh, then I became the chief financial officer, and then I started the capital campaign. I can remember our 125th anniversary of uh, 25 years ago. Um, Father Lochran and Father Keenan, who was the president of St. Peter's Prep, and I went to see the archbishop to get him to participate in, uh, in our celebration of our anniversary and say a mass at St. Aidan's and do some things. And he agreed to do that. And he also 
uh, we asked him for our approval, his approval for us to run the capital campaign. And uh, he said, yes. And he said to me, he said, and John, I'll volunteer to be the honorary chairman. If you need me, I'll happy to do that. And I'll even make sure we make a contribution to the campaign. So it was kind of an interesting experience doing the 125th anniversary. So oh, well, I'm surprised wow. I'm still around for the 150th. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, it's always strange uh, being a young young person and like laughing at like jokes about old age. I, yeah. I never want to come off as like rude or anything, but it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and just one, one last question. You talked about uh, Senator McCarthy and the rise of McCarthyism and that paranoia. Um, when school, I'm only taught about it, you know, very factually, but I'm wondering if that paranoia was present on campus, like did it disrupt? It, I, you know, as a source of a lot of conversations, um, I don't think it disrupted our campus life at all, at all, at all, but it was, you know, a source of debate. Some people thought he was doing the right thing, you know, weeding out communism. Uh, other people like myself thought he was on a witch hunt. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, so there were differing views of it. And, and uh, you know, my, I, my sense is my, I was more right than they were, but who knows? <laughs> 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 uh, but that's the way it goes. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't disruptive or anything like that, or it didn't cause riots. It, you know, it caused mostly discussion about what was going on with it, because it was really a very important topic of the day in those days. I mean, it was, it was uh, something that everybody was talking about. And uh, what about in, uh, in Jersey City? Did, was it present in Jersey City life? Or did, was something happening in the community at the time because of that? No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, Jersey City politicians are a unique brand, unique brand. I can remember when President Kennedy uh, ran for office and it was the weekend before um, the election in November. I know I was up in Journal Square. I wanted to listen to him because I admired him a lot. And uh, he comes up there. It's a cold day. I'm standing out there for five hours waiting for him to show up freezing at that, but I was going to stand there anyway. <laughs> and uh, he comes up and he takes off his jacket. He's tan, looks like a million dollars. And all he does is pick on Jersey City politicians <laughs> and, and how bad they are. And I'm sitting there laughing. I'm saying, you know, the guy is amazing. He's running, trying to get votes and he's just picking on these guys. I said, I love it. <laughs> Wait, he was this in, he in was person? A, they what? Was this in person? Yes, was in person. He was, he gave a speech in Journal Square. Oh my God. And, uh, he was, he was, he was amazing. I, um, you know, my Irish Catholic mother, you know, she almost uh, threw my brothers out of the house because they voted for Nixon. They didn't vote for President Kennedy and I voted for President Kennedy. So I was the good guy in the family because <laughs> he was an Irish Catholic. That you know, that had a you had to vote for him. That was the way she looked at it. Right. I said, That's not why I'm voting for him. <laughs> no, he no, was, he was he was great. Yeah, it was a uh, mm -hmm. it was an interesting time. Um, the, um, the the Jersey City mayors were always in trouble. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one of our alums uh, who, who started the Jersey City Waterfront Project, uh, Sheehan, Mayor Sheehan. Uh, he, had, he wrote that uh, project up as his thesis for St. Peter's when he was graduating. <laughs> no way. And yeah, and he, wow. yeah, and he, uh, he got later, I think he ended up in prison too, so. Oh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's oh okay. A, well, and you know, the guy that was, the, I think the guy that was one of the guys that was a mayor at the time, turned out he wasn't even a citizen. <laughs> so, oh my God. <laughs> and so, 
it was it was a different place to grow up. <laughs> right, the New but Jersey fun. notorious for its political machine. Yeah. So that was in okay. So that yeah. was happening at the time. That yeah, was. <laughs> oh. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, thank and you. And the for mayor that. of Jersey City, number of years there, Mayor Haig, he was noted all around the country for what he did. Uh, you know, he built that medical center down there, which is now a condo. Um, as a matter of fact, the Jersey City wanted St. Peter's to look at it as a as a uh, part of the school campus and buy the medical center. <laughs> and we didn't do it because it, uh, the, the problem with the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, what is that stuff? Asbestos in that building uh, was so bad, it would have cost millions of dollars to remedy it. So right. by the locker room and myself said, we can't touch that. We don't have the dough to fool around with it. So. But we, uh, you know, whenever we had a building up there, we'd look at it and try and buy it. <laughs> but that was not one of them. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, my next question um, is, why is St. Peter's now university an important institution of higher learning? Well, I, I think, Precisely because of people like you and me. Because, uh, you know, it is a great place for first generation kids to go to school. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, commonality among their backgrounds. And, you know, they may not be from the same country, but they got the same issues to mm -hmm. deal with. And, uh, and I think the Jesuits, their background and the way they teach just do a great job in that arena. And, and thank God St. Peter's is there. It's, it's more affordable than a lot of other places, mm -hmm. um, you know, are. Um, and they give out more support to the kids than other places do. So mm -hmm. I hope it stays around for a long, long time. As um, do I, John. It, St. Peter's is... Um, you know, really, it gave me a chance to go to school. Yeah. Um, and um, if they didn't give me such a generous scholarship, I wouldn't have had my degree. And yeah. the same goes to many of my other friends. As you said, you are um, in community with other working class, first generation students that understand that kind of struggle, but they're just trying to, um, you know, improve their situation, yep. make their parents proud and yep. get a, get an education. So, yeah. and then, you know, it's, um, if you, there's a lot of history of Irish people in America being successful and a lot of it points to the mothers who kind of insisted their boys get a good education. Right. And, and you know, the, the Irish have a reputation for being heavy drinkers. Well, the fathers were, but the mothers were. And the mothers insisted on getting their boys an education so they could compete. And Irish people have done very well in America. And, you know, when they first came here, um, it was, they were under the thumb of everybody. You know, they used to, couldn't get jobs. They had right. signs and windows, I-N-N-A, which said, Irish need not apply. That was what it stood for. And, you know, if you were Irish, you couldn't get a job. And so you had to work your way out. And education is a way to achieve that goal. And exactly. the, uh, the Jesuits did a great job with it. So I, I, I love them. <laughs> right. And, you know, the, uh, St. Peter's, the professors that are now my mentors um, have just been so understanding of who I am, right? Um, you know, uh, so I just, I'm deeply indebted to the university and, uh, I hope that I can, you know, continue in your path and give back to the institution. Um, I think my experience is, is, is different in, in many ways and particularly because I was in school during COVID, um, uh, which is a whole other conversation on its own, but I know. 
Yeah, we did. I, I do see a, a lot of uh, the, the similar perspective and we both deeply appreciate St. Peter's. Um, and uh, before we end our chat, I um, was wondering if you had uh, and anything else that you would like to add uh, to, to um, today's talk, anything you want to make sure gets in there? Well, just to cement your point that you just made about how the professors were understanding and help you. When I became the chief financial officer of St. Peter's when yeah, I retired, um, I got to know a lot of the professors up there are kind of close because, you know, I was there every day, eight hours a day, <laughs> or actually 10 hours a day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, um, it was enlightening to see how they operated and how they were very good with the students and how the students reacted to them and appreciated them. It, it was, it was kind of really nice to, to right. do. And, uh, you know, we saw them and I, I enjoyed uh, working with them and I've, um, I don't know, you, you probably wouldn't know anything about it, but there's a golf outing up there um, at St. Peter's called the All Sports Golf Outing. It's run in June every year. And it's named after my brother, the William J. Murray Golf Outing, <laughs> Memorial Golf Outing. And um, my brother and I and Billy Stein, who was the athletic director and one of the other alums had a meeting one day and said, let's start this golf outing and do it. And it's been going on now for probably 25 years, raising money for the sports programs. And, and the professors have helped out. They have come to this thing and they meet with the alums and talk with them. And they, and they do just a nice job. And I don't think Eileen Poyani has missed one in years. <laughs> she, oh, she has, she's still she's there. Been, she's been there. And Jean Konaki is mm -hmm. there. And uh, Leah Lito, you know, they all come out and support it. So it, it's kind of a nice thing. Father Lachman said to me, it was kind of funny. He said, you know, John, he says, if you died before your brother, Bill, we would have named it the John Murray Golf Tournament. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, wow. <laughs> what are you supposed to say to that? Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. It was fun. But I have nothing but fond memories of St. Peter's and all the good work it does. Right. Um, well, thank And you. I know you will do very well in your career, too, because you got a good education. Oh, well, thank you. And yes, I agree. I think I'm well prepared for what comes. Um, but I am going to now end our chat and okay. I'm going to end the recording. If you could just stay on for a couple of seconds after. Oh. Okay, no problem. Okay, so let me just end the recording here. Um,